Hello everybody, I am No Lux Given. I am a very highly ranked drafter in Soulforge, and if you came to this video, that means you want to be just like me. I don't know what I'm getting at here exactly, but let's hop into it. I want to do a draft here, and I am going to just kind of talk through all of my picks, and want to get everybody playing in draft, and I know that, I, I guess basically here's here's what I'm getting at. A lot of times constructed is hard to get at for new players because they don't have the collection yet. And I think draft is a great option for new players because everybody's kind of on the same equal footing, but the more you know, the better it goes. So there are, this is actually a pretty crazy pack as far as draft is concerned. I think that Aloy and Strategist and Wirewood Patriarch are maybe two of the best cards that you can get to start off with a draft. So I want to talk about every single card we see during the draft and hopefully that will give you guys some insight in terms of what I think is good in draft, what I think is bad but I do want to do a caveat to that before we even start off anything. That caveat is like, sometimes you're going to see tier lists or things like those, and those are very helpful. Um, people that are familiar with Magic Drafting or Hearthstone Arena will be familiar with the idea of a tier list. But there is an awkward part with the tier list that like it ranks certain cards better than others... And that's not necessarily going to be true for every player. The individual tier list will be good if you have the same play style as the people that have created that tier list. But you do have to be careful because there's lots of different ways to play Soul Forge, And that's why I think watching the games that happen after this draft are going to be equally or likely even more important. Uh, that said... The strategies that I use in this draft are just my own strategies that I've found that have worked for me, but you might even find that you happen to like some other cards more, and uh, that's, that's totally fine. What I want to do here first off is just start off by opening up every card, just taking a look at them, and uh, kind of talking about them. So... You'll hear me throw out a lot of different keywords uh, referring to potential stat lines on cards. Hopefully they make sense by the end of it, just hearing certain phrases enough. Uh, but I know it can be a lot because there might be a lot of words if you're new to Soulforge that you haven't heard before. This card just has a reasonable stat line, 4, 8, 7, 11, 13, 17. I would like the 13 to potentially be a little bit higher. Uh, if we compare this to... So, so 4, 8, 7, 11, 13, 17. Let's think about this card and then how it stacks up against... Uh, Contagion Lord, but also just, I'm going to go for the common uh, Zithian Hulk. So it's got one less toughness, one more attack, and then one more attack. So it's actually got a total of one less total numbers. And you can't just, in general, add up all of the numbers on a Soulforge card. Like, I'm not going to say, okay, 11, 30, then what is this, 31? I'm not going to give this card a value of 61 and the other card a value of 60 because that isn't really that helpful. But you want to look at how these cards line up in a typical game. A 4-7 is a lot of times going to be the exact same thing as a 4-8. The only difference being that a 4-8 will trade with a 7-7 seven, seven, and a 4-7 will negative battle with a 7-7. Seven, seven. A 4-8, on the other hand, 
can trade with like a 1610. Now that's that's a pretty or I'm sorry, not a 1610, a uh, a, a 1016, which isn't really a normal stat line that you'll see. Um, but but the fact that it does get up to 16 after it's battled twice against something is relevant. And then this, of course, uh, the biggest thing that a 1417 can do is that it can positively battle with a 1414. That's not going to come up too much, but a positive battle on a 1414 compared to a trade on a 1414 for the rare in our other pack. Of course, the rare does have an ability, and we'll look at that in a second. But in terms of stat lines, a lot of times I'm either going to be comparing things in my head to about this stat line, Zithian Hulk, or I'm going to be comparing them to... Uh, what's a good example? Well, you know... Here's a good example. The other card that I'm probably going to compare things to is the stat line of Master of Elements. Maybe not. Normally you see like a stat line of... Oh, I, I know a good card for it. Uh, at least I think I do. Yeah, so this is, this is like a... This stat line is really insane. You get the 15 attack... What was the... Yes, Tower Scout. That's its name. So, 5-5, five, 9-9, five, nine, nine, 15, 15. This is like a reasonable... And even 10-10, ten, ten, especially without the mobility, this is another stat line that a lot of things will get compared to. So, we'll keep this in mind as we continue to look at the other cards here. And then there's also, there is one more stat line, and I'm glad this pack gets to show off everything, and that is stat lines with higher attack than toughness. And these kind of have their own thing going on that I will talk about in a second here. But notably, even if you just look at the numbers on these packs, Dark Frost Reaper is going to negative battle with, vo with both Venomous Nether Scale and Wirewood Patriarch. If these two cards do battle, Patriarch will have one health left over. If Nether Scale and Reaper do battle, then uh, Nether Scale will have two health left over. Uh, Reaper can trade with Master of Elements and Alloyan Strategist, and uh, but it can't can't trade with the first two cards. And then Alloyan Strategist and Master are a negative battle both to Wirewood. Patriarch and Nether Scale, uh, both of these two cards trade with. So all of that is just stuff to keep in mind. I don't really have a name for just creatures with big butts, as you'd say in Magic, uh, but but higher defense than attack, higher toughness than power. But anyways, let's get on to the abilities before I. Just <laughs> uh, talk about all the numbers for too much here. So double the poison on each enemy creature and the enemy player. I don't think that this ability is too, too relevant. This card used to be a lot more potent. It also used to give a poison when it came into play. I think now it's probably something that you want to avoid. I think that it is pretty much just a vanilla creature. And that's another term I'm borrowing from Magic the Gathering. But... Vanilla essentially meaning that the abilities... Uh, well, a vanilla actually means that the card has no abilities. But in this instance, I'm saying that it's near vanilla if the ability is not too likely to be relevant. Then we have a Loyan Strategist. All of his power is tied up in his ability. As you see, he has minus one attack on every level from Tower Scout... And still manages to be one of the best heroics in the game. Adjacent creatures get plus two attack, plus four attack, plus six attack, and mobility one, two, three. So this is going to be able to do something very powerful. And this is 
called a combat trick sometimes or a battle trick. Basically, let's look at the application of this ability, adjacent creatures get, get plus two attack, in reference to the different forms of creatures that we have available here. So, if we were able to give Master of Elements plus two attack, it would turn a negative battle into a trade on Wirewood Patriarch. If we were able to give it to Dark Frost Reaper, it would then be able to trade with Nether Scale. It would actually take Nether Scale from. Oh yeah, that's 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 the same thing. That's only one step up. Is the uh, the the negative battle to a uh, trade. Now, if we have a level 2 Alloyan Strategist, adjacent creatures get plus 4 attack. We can do... Do we have any options for it? No. Oh, right, yeah. With just a plus attack, there's no way to trade a neg or change a negative battle into a positive battle just by giving plus attack. But we could then give Venom Venomous Nether Scale plus 4 attack. It would be able to take out a Nether Scale or a Patriarch or a Alloyan Strategist all in one hit and make that a positive battle. So a lot of times that's going to be a really powerful ability. The stat line is just a little bit under what you would appreciate, but it already typically gets its value just by entering play. And then it also has mobility, which is going to facilitate as damage push. And um, also just be hard for your opponent to immediately kill. Then we have Phytobomb. I don't really think that this card is near in power level to some of the other cards. This card has more synergy going on with it. Synergy refers to how the card interacts with the other cards that you've drafted. Basically, it puts a 1-1 one, one into each player's available spaces, which means it fills all 10 available spaces on the board same thing for the level two, and then the level three gives you five, five, five tree folks, or however many tree folks as you have spaces available to create. So the level three does have some payoff, but you really need some synergy to actually make it work. Wirewood Patriarch can provide that synergy. He gives your low attacked creatures a bonus. Also, Wirewood Patriarch, let's look at the stat line. Let's compare it into our heads with the uh, Abomination that we looked at earlier. So 4-7 compared to 5-7. We've got a plus one and we have an ability. That's already pretty good. All right, here then we have a minus two. Each friendly creature, uh, well, yeah, a minus two on the stat line over 8-11. And then we have the same stat line on level three. So that means we are looking at a the exact same stat line as Venomous Nether Scale. Uh, basically, it's the same on attack one, one less toughness on rank two, and then one additional attack on rank three. Now, this one less uh, toughness on rank two can come up, or I'm sorry, I I'm going to start saying health just to not confuse everybody. Toughness is the magic term, but... One less health on rank two. Me that that can be a crucial number because you're gonna look at now everything we've seen so far is like a nine nine. We are gonna see a lot of ten tens too, so that is important to keep in mind. But we have a very very relevant ability with its forge ability. So as it comes into play, if you played it from your hand, you get this additional ability. Give all your friendly dudes with three or less attack plus two plus two, with five or less attack plus three plus three, and seven plus five plus five. So what's really, really good about this is, sure, this rank one, all that's going to affect is your Phytobomb seeds and weird things like that. Uh, there are some like three sevens that come up from time to time. Typically creatures with activate abilities, but for the most part, that ability isn't going to be super, super relevant. What is going to be relevant is the level two that gives your five attack or less creatures, plus three, plus three. 
What is 4 plus 3? 7. What is 8 plus 3? 11. That means, and you could do you could do the same thing for this one too. What's 5 plus 3? 8. What's 7 plus 3? 10. That means this level 2 card is trading up all of your level 1 cards in play into level 2 creatures. I'll let that sink in for a second. 5 plus 3 is going to give you 8. 7 plus 3 is going to give you 10. That means that the level 2 patriarch turns your level 1 patriarchs that are currently on the battlefield into what are essentially level 2 creatures. You don't get quite the same bonus going from level 2 to level 3. It's only a plus 5 plus 5. So we're then looking at a 12-15, but those are still really powerful numbers. Again, uh, it's not going to change the ability on a Loyan Strategist, but a plus three, plus three is going to get this guy to a 7-8, and a plus, oh, I'm sorry, this guy actually can't receive a plus five, plus five, uh, but it can receive a plus three, plus three to make it a 7-8, and... Uh, that's going to come up a lot, and it's why Wirewood Patriarch is one of the most powerful heroics that you can pick. Moving on to Dark Frost Reaper. I've kind of said this before, I don't really like this card's stat line. Destroy each creature with one or less attack is a reasonable ability, and there are creatures with one or less attack that you are going to want to be able to blow up with... Um, you are going to want to be able to blow up problem creatures that only have uh, one or less attack. So the ability does become relevant, but it's not relevant enough. I don't believe that you trade off so much as far as its stats go. And then we have Master of Elements, which has, I believe, a fine stat line. Uh, actually, even a good stat line. I think if it was just a 5-5, 9-9, 15, 15, it would be fine, a little bit unimpressive. But the fact that it gets to 17, 17 at the last level means that... So how does it line up against, let's say, Venomous Nether Scale? It's going to trade, trade, positive battle. Against Wirewood Patriarch... Trade, trade, positive battle. So it actually is a pretty good late game threat. And then the forge of being able to play a free level one or level two or lower spell is going to have a reasonable impact on the game. So what do I like the most in this pack? I actually think there are... Four reasonable cards to take in this pack. Yeah, I am just streaming on the official client because uh, I want this to be the most accessible for newer players. So not going to be using the uh, Kaleri's unofficial Soulforge client, but you can check that out if you have not already on SoulforgeLadder.com. It's just an alternative client that Kaleri works on. Um... They they both have have different trade offs. The two different clients. Uh, so so really, there's three main cards that I think are good first picks in this pack: Master of Elements, Alloyan Strategist, Wirewood Patriarch. If I were to rank these cards power level wise, I would probably say Alloyan Strategist, Wirewood Patriarch, and Master of elements. The mobility as well as just how much plus six attack on adjacent creatures is, I think gives a Loyan Strategist the edge over Wirewood Patriarch, but it's really close. Both of these are top five heroics, and I think both of these are, or, or Master of Elements is top 10, top 15. So one consideration can be made in terms of what colors you like to draft or what factions you like to draft. I'm just going to take what I think is objectively the most powerful card here, and I'm going to take 
Aloyan strategist. Then, all right, we've we've got some interesting ones here. Let's go ahead and read them. Flame Lance deals five to the enemy creature and five to the enemy player. And then seven and then nine. Okay. Blood Boon can give a creature plus three, plus three. And if a creature died this turn, it gets an additional plus three, plus three. So six, eight, 14. 14 is pretty high. Okay. Just for now. Oh, uh, what's the best way to do this? You know what? I guess I'll just talk about all the cards in order. That's what I've been doing so far. So Flame Lance, I think, is an okay card in general. You want to avoid spells. I guess the reason I was moving on from Flame Lance is I kind of wanted to just compare it to a creature. So Flame Lance is good for damage push, which means it's good late game, and it's good as an underdrop. It can turn a trade into a positive battle, or it can tra change a negative battle into a trade. But that's pretty much all it's going to be able to do. Maybe every once in a while it can change a negative battle into a positive one. Like if you, you have an Aether Guard out or something. But basically, let's compare Flame Lance to Aether Guard. Which I'm also going to just add the caveat that I don't think Aether Guard is good. Having said that, Aether Guard, if you play this against an opposing creature, it's going to deal 6 damage to it, 8 damage to it, and 14 damage to it. And basically what I'm getting at here is spells just are not going to scale the same way that creatures do. Sure, this gets to deal some damage to the enemy player, but it has no upside of, like, an actual creature sticking around on the board. So, I think that aspect of it is pretty bad. And the numbers just don't scale. 5 versus 6, 7 versus 9, and then 9 versus 14. And that's on a pretty, or sorry, 7 versus 8. So it's dealing less damage than Aether Guard, which I think is like already a pretty bad creature. Aether Guard, Flamestoke Shaman, and Dr. Frankenbaum are all kind of a wash in the attack stat because they all have six attack. And one of the things that you do start trying to look for when you don't have anything else to do is what can I do when, like, okay, this, I'm going to induce, introduce a new term, and that new term is the term underdrop. And basically, the theory is that creatures with higher attack than health make good plays once you're out of player level one. A lot of the times you aren't going to want to level these creatures. And we're going to see an exception in Flamestoke Shaman. Because even though this card does have Underdrop-esque stats, uh, it does have a level-gated ability. Which means an ability that can only affect creatures of the same level as it. And not creatures above that level. Which means you're going to need to level Flamestoke Shaman to really get the optimum uses out of it. So I already said I don't like Aether Guard. Its stat line is below average, and I don't think that its ability is worth playing basically because I don't think that you want to play that many spells. Now, there are some spells that are really, really super powerful, and one strategy in draft we're only going to be able to cover one strategy like in this video. I can't really show off an aggro draft and a grow wide deck and a um, Voltron deck and like a combo deck all in the same thing. Uh, having said that, if you want to check out my YouTube channel, I have lots of old draft videos there. Not any with the new draft pool 
but there are still lots of old draft videos and there's a lot of great content there if you feel like plunging into all of that. And there's a lot of good information to be gleaned there as well, I think. Um, I probably have like 50 or so Soul Forge drafts and hopefully growing up on my YouTube channel. So I don't like Aetherguard. How do I feel about Flamestoke Shaman? I think its stats are a lot more reasonable. The level 1 stats are definitely underwhelming. They're going to trade with something like a 5-5 or an Alloyan Strategist. But the level 2 stats get to trade with pretty much everything. And the level 3 stats get to trade with pretty much everything. So as long as you can take a small hit on player level 1, which usually you can, then you can get a sizable creature. The problem with stats like this... Now, these numbers are pretty beefy, but you are going to see some creatures, like, this attack is only one point off of being able to kill this level 2. And this attack can kill the level 3. So that's where things like Flamestoke Shaman get very risky, and I don't like to draft them, is because, now, I do like to draft them as underdrops, I just don't like to draft them as actual cards, because... Somebody can just draw a level 2 Flamestoke Shaman and put it in front of my level 3, and then they've just, they haven't gained an advantage on me per se. We've traded one play for one play, but they've now leveled up their deck more, and they can now play their level 3 in an open lane, whereas I put a lot of work into getting my level 3 and didn't get that much reward out of it. So that is something to consider when considering creatures with stat lines like this. Uh, Dr. Frankenbaum is going to have a stat line more similar to the Aether Guard, just a little bit more powerful. And he's got an ability that may seem really good when you first start playing. It may seem really bad, depending on your experience with other card games. I will say this ability... And uh, also the Flamestoke Shaman's ability, I think, is really good. But Dr. Frankenbaum's ability is pretty solid. And this card is actually quite playable, if just for the ability. So this is a card I would consider taking in this pack. The Flamestoke Shaman, just to talk about some potential synergies and stuff that might come up. Uh, I have done some Flamestoke Shaman drafts that have been pretty sweet. Basically, some cool things you can do. Flamestoke can activate other Flamestokes. It can activate mobility creatures, so you can do neat things there. And it can activate creatures with activate abilities. Uh, so all of that in tandem can do some pretty silly things. Like imagine if I activated uh, an Alloyan Strategist with Flamestoke Shaman and then was able to move the Alloyan Strategist over so that it was... Uh, pumping up the appropriate lane, that all would have been pretty sweet. So I want to take a second to talk about Blood Boon. This card is pretty interesting, but I think underwhelming. So while it can give plus four or plus six, plus eight, plus fourteen, you have to weigh that ability of Blood Boon with the ability for it to act as a combat trick. Because you either need your creatures to die, or a creature to die, before you cast Blood Boon, or you need to cast Blood Boon to save one of your creatures from dying, or to influence combat. The best use of a plus three plus three is when you can change a negative battle into a positive battle. An example of that would be um, the Dark Frost Reaper that we saw in pack one. If you give that plus three, plus three, it's going to go from a negative battle on Wirewood Patriarch, the 5-7, to a positive battle. It'll turn it into a 9-6, and then it will survive as a 9-1 with one point of toughness left over. So while that's sweet, you can't actually do that and get the full bonus out of Blood Boon, which really just means it's going to result in a plus three, plus three, plus four, plus four, or plus seven, plus seven 
if not impacting battle. There are going to be times where you get the full bonus, but those times aren't going to present themselves as much as you'd like. And for that reason, I'm going to look at one of two, either Flamestoke Shaman and Dr. Frankenbaum. I think Dr. Frankenbaum is a slightly better card. Flamestoke Shaman, I do think, is reasonably powerful. But I'm going to take Dr. Frankenbaum, which means we're going to look for abominations. But you're going to see I'm also not going to aggressively level Dr. Frankenbaum and, and instead keep it as an underdrop that we talked about because this six health can oftentimes kill stuff at rank one. So let's take up this. This is now going to turn our deck and lock us into these two factions. This is something that I haven't talked about yet, but it is a very important part of the drafting process. Alloyan Strategist is an Alloyan card, and you can tell that by its Alloyan border, uh, that it's, uh, you know, this is um, purple, where is this has a, I guess I'd say teal stripe here. Dr. Frankenbaum is Necrium, and you can tell this because of the Necrium border, the purple border here. And once we've picked two factions, assuming we're, we're not doing any kind of weird weekend warrior kind of stuff, which if you're not already familiar on the weekends... There are alternate draft and constructed formats that are always fun to check out. But once we've taken cards of two separate factions, that is going to lock us into those factions. Unlike Magic, where you draft some cards, and Eternal, where you draft some cards that you don't use, this is much more similar to Hearthstone Arena. You draft 30 cards. Those cards are your deck. So every single card you draft is going to be a makeup in your deck. Now, you do still have some control over your deck in the individual games in terms of what you decide to level. But that's why every pick, even the last picks, become so important. Because every single card is going to be in your deck, which means every single card does matter. Let's take a look at Scavenger Scorpion. It is a 6-6, six, 9-9, six, nine, nine, 11, 11 with Regenerate. A lot of times what I do with Regenerate and Armor is I add that number to the health. So I would call this card a 6-7, a 9-11, and an 11-14. If a card has particularly high health, you can add the Regenerate to it twice. Like say this was a 6-9. Well that's probably going to take two hits to take down, say, from something like a... Or you know what? Let's just make up a card here. Let's say we have a 3-9 regenerate one. Well, that 3-9, a lot of the times that's going to battle twice with something and then potentially still survive. So I would look at that 3-9 regen one, and I would call that a 3-11. However, just looking at this card's stats, 6-11, very strong. That's the draw of this card and this card is definitely an underdrop but it's an underdrop that doesn't really scale that well it is an abomination which is something that sometimes you do have to consider but really this card is just an underdrop that sometimes will be viable in some certain strategies but mostly you're going to see it see play because of the abomination status 911 reasonable but nothing to get too excited about. A 911 is still going to trade with a 710. Uh, that is, what, three less total stat points, but it's still going to trade with a 710. And to boot, it's not really a 911. It's going to actually trade with things that are just 99 and the like. 1114, really, really terrible for a level three card. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. It's just not good. Nairali Ooze is a 2-2 that makes a 4-4 into the same space. So I would call this a 6-6. Six, six. A 4-4 four, four that makes a 7-7 seven, seven into the same space. So I would call this an 11-11. And then a 7-7 seven, seven that makes an 11-11. So I would call this an 18-18. Except it doesn't really 
play out exactly that way. I just like to throw out numbers so that, you know, you can compare things because it's tough to compare make a 4-4 oozling to regenerate one. What does that mean? Well, in this case, it means that the ooze isn't going to trade with the scavenger scorpion. That's a very specific example in terms of regenerate, but it is worth noting that Nerali ooze uh, negative battles, trades, and then trades with a card that I just said is pretty shit. Now, where the ooze is good is it allows you to break up its damage. Say your opponent has a 14-7. Let's say they have an Alloyan Strategist with 8 damage already on it. So it's a 14-7. You can plop this level 3 ooze right in front of that, and then you'll still have an 11-11 to show for it. Those are the scenarios that you're looking for with Nairali Ooze. However, those scenarios aren't always available, which means sometimes you just wind up, like even though this is an 1818, let's say Alloyan Strategist didn't have mobility, or, or even better, let's just compare it to Dr. Frankenbaum. Dr. Frankenbaum, bad stat line on level three, but it's still gonna trade with Nerali Ooze if it hasn't taken any damage. Also, if you just play Nerali Ooze on an open board, it's only threatening two, four, and seven points of damage, which means your opponent can wait until they have an appropriate answer till they decide to deal with it because it's not actually going to threaten your opponent's life total that quickly. 120 life points divided by seven, what does that give you? That gives you like seven plus seven plus three hits. It gives you like 17 hits, which is effectively... Uh, like, well, each, each player level's eight turns, so it's two entire player levels, which means if you haven't taken any other damage, which is unlikely, somebody could play this on 3.1 and it wouldn't kill you until 4.4. .4. So it's not really that threatening, and you don't really... It, it's not as powerful as 18, 18 total stats would seem. Crypt Whale, I've actually got to read this card. Oh, that's why I have to read it. Okay, so this card is strictly damage push. It deals 5, 7, 9 damage to the enemy player. You gain that much health, and if a creature has... Oh, no, 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 this is Raid. Okay, if three or more enemy creatures initiated battle this turn, you double that damage instead this card has no impact on the board. It just deals damage to their life total. Every once in a while, you're going to want a card like this just for some late game damage push. It does add up if you start dealing damage, having your abominations die. You can see how that might add up. I don't think any of these cards are nearly as powerful as Dr. Frankenbaum. So I'm going to take another one of those. You've may have realized my explanations have taken a long time. As we move along, you're going to notice, though, that there are less cards in each pack. So what happens in Soulforge Draft, just to talk about the format of it, you're going to see six cards, one of which is, or sorry, all of which are going to be heroics. Then you are going to see uh, five cards, with slightly lower power level. Then you're going to see four cards with slightly lower power level. Then three cards with slightly lower power level. And then two cards with, on average, slightly lower power level. Now that's not to say you can't get a 30th pick legendary. It's definitely possible. I've done it before. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to see a decrease in the number of cards and in the overall power level of the cards that you are seeing. Then once it gets to only two cards left in the pack, you'll see it'll go back up to six in the next pack, and the power level won't be as high, but you'll see a, a general refresh in, uh, in the power level here. So let's take a look at these cards here. Jetpack, I'm not sure if this card 
is going to get changed again. For right now, this card represents just damage push, and it can actually represent a lot of damage push. Think about putting a level one... I I'm not sure if I mentioned this. I don't think I have. One of the strengths of spells is the ability that you typically don't have to level them. And Jetpack pretty much here, like... The level th 2 and 3 are very unimpressive comparatively to the level 1. You're not getting more ability. You're not getting that much more attack. Sure, it does double and triple, uh, but the, the base rate is already, like, the strength of this card. The reason that you'd play Jetpack, though, is so that you can move a creature over, be able to hit your opponent for, like, 17 damage or something, and then... Uh, hopefully be able to do that one more time, and then all of a sudden you've dealt like 30 damage to your opponent that they weren't expecting. That said, I still think Jetpack is a little bit underpowered, and we're not going to be taking it here. Palladium Hindermind is good. I don't think it's fantastic. Each enemy creature gets minus one, two, and three attack. So let's say that you hit two creatures on each level at an average. Basically, what we're looking at here is a 2-8. I'm adding both of those minus one attacks to the toughness to get a total scale of what this card would represent. 2-8, not that powerful. 6-14, uh, sure, it's going to trade with stuff. And a 12-22, sure, it's going to trade with stuff. And so you're going to see a lot of these cards are going to trade they might change the course of battle on some of your cards i think palladium hindermine is a to be honest it's probably an undervalued card um maybe i even overvalue it but it isn't that impressive while you're ahead it could potentially make you lose some of your leads just because okay say say you have the initiative like your opponent doesn't have anything that you need to block. You just play Palladium Hindermind, and they can play a lot of things that that just um, that you know just just positive battle it. They can just play a ten ten and eat your six ten. If given the option, I would rather pump my own creatures than shrink my opponents, but. Uh, this is still a fine card. Ionic War Charger, however, is a fantastic card. Take a look at this stat line. 4-7, 9-12, 15-18. So this is 11 plus 20, 32, uh, 50. Yeah, gets us to 65. So 65 total for the stat line compared to the 60s and 61s. I believe that we were looking at earlier. This card also has mobility, which just makes it strictly better than the very first abomination, um, whose, whose name I forget. I'm not always super great with names, so I apologize for that. But this card is great. 65 total stat points. The 15 toughness is well, or sorry, 15 attack uh, we're finally getting to see here now as well. That means it just gets to completely gobble up things like a Loyan strategist that are left on the board. And it can even help to chase it down. This is one of the best commons in the game. It's not doing anything super fancy. And it's not really going to see any constructed play. Though it is notable that it's a robot, potentially. But this card's just a fantastic stat line. Mobility means it can provide damage push late game. It's a great card. We're going to take Ionic War Charger here. Alrighty. So like I said, the card quality goes down over time. Let's take a look at these two cards. Charnel Titan is a 3, 5, 5, 8, 9, 14. So pretty poor. Stat line that gets plus 3, plus 3, plus 5, plus 5, and plus 7, plus 7. If there's an enemy creature with that much or less attack. So then we're looking at a 6-8, great. A 10-13, great. And a 16-21, fantastic. The problem is you can't always count on Charnel Titan's trigger to happen. 
If the trigger doesn't happen, it's pretty terrible. If the trigger does happen, that can be pretty great. One kind of cool thing that Abyssian Aloyan does have going for it, or I'm sorry, Necrium Aloyan does have going for it, is the fact that Aloyan can shrink their attacks, and then Necrium can take advantage of that shrunken attacks on triggers for things like Charnel Titan and some other cards that we might see in the future. That might be a route that I decide to go for this draft, and Charnel Titan is potentially at its best when paired with Aloyan. So that is something to keep in mind. I think Charnel Titan is, again, potentially underrated, but you do have to be careful with it. Now, one thing that does work very well with Charnel Titan is leaving creatures on your opponent's side of the board. And by that, I mean, say your opponent has a 4-4. Say they have a 5-5. That card's hitting you for 5 every turn. Don't block it. Take 20 damage. Take 30 damage from it. And then reap the rewards of a 10-13. And even though you've taken a lot more damage than your opponent, especially the reward of a 16-21, sometimes be willing to just take those hits. Now player level 4 rolls around, and this card's going to seem a lot worse, as there's just going to be less creatures with 7 or less attack on the battlefield. That said, it's still something worth considering. Felstrider is a 4 3 8 6 10 9, which spawns a zombie double its size, or uh, the equal to its size, effectively doubling all of those numbers. However, this is spawn, which means that you put it into an available space at random. It's much, much worse than, I guess it's sometimes better but generally much worse uh, just as a result of it being random. It doesn't make this a horrible card, but it means that I'm not going to be looking towards it. If we needed something to slightly edge us out, Charnel Titan is an abomination. I am going to pick Charnel Titan because I'm in a Loyan. I will say that if this was a... Uh, Nairali Symbiote, whatever that card was, called the 224477 that made a 4477 If those were my options, I would be taking the Ooze here instead of the Abomination. But I am going to take Charnel Titan, and maybe we can get some synergistic stuff going on here. Something like a meta transfer is pretty cool. We can discard a card and level it up, but also give a creature minus 5 attack which is going to work really well with Charlie. Spirit Leash is going to work well with our zombies. Uh, we sack or destroy a friendly creature to give a plus 5, plus 5, plus 8, and plus 14 bonus. Those are pretty big numbers. I don't think I'm going to go that route, but it is worth considering. Sparkblade Assassin, actually a fine card. The level 2 is very, very powerful. The level 3 is a little bit underwhelming and as is the level 1, but you can find some scenarios where those level 1s and level 3s are good, and those level 2s just wind up being uh, really, really powerful. I don't actually know the total stat lines on this, but if we add them up real quick, we'll see 25, 40, 54, 54 plus 9, so it looks like 63, if I did that math right. So this card's level 2, makes it good enough that it actually has bigger stats than a lot of other creatures total. Now, you can't just totally look at that, but that is still very interesting to consider. And I think Sparkblade Assassin is quite a reasonable card because that level 2 is so good. A lot of games are decided on player level 2. I generally go for ending my games on player level 3 and player level 4. But if you want to end your games on player level 2, Sparkblade Assassin may just be the card for you. We have Nexus Tactician, which becomes pretty tough to evaluate. I'm going to do the same thing that I did with Palladium Hindermind. Um, and I'm going to look at a 3... Well, I don't know if you can add... 
double the amount of armor. Maybe you just add one. Say it's a 3, 8, 6, 12, and then 13, 21. That said, other than on the Nexus tech itself, these bonuses are going to stick around for another turn cycle. Nexus tech winds up generally being pretty good. I'll just break the news to you. It winds up being pretty good. Uh, and uh, I, I think it is going to be the card that we're going to take here, but not without first discussing these two uh, Necrium commons. Both of these commons are quite fantastic. So the difference between Corpulent Shambler and the Ooze is this Corpulent Shambler has all of its power, or I'll say most of its power, in the front half of it, which means we can plan for it very easily. We know exactly what this 5-5 five five is going to do, and then we just get a 3-3 three three zombie as a bonus. So that bonus is going to be a creature that we can sacrifice, a creature that we can pump up, some recursive damage on our opponent, or just a one-time three-shot damage on a creature that they try to block the zombie token with. A 5-5, five, 7-7 five, seven, seven is a little bit underwhelming, but 15-15 15, 15 is on par. If we compare this to, like, uh, you know, our 5-5, 10-10, 15-15 our five, five, range, obviously this level is a little bit underwhelming, but you still get this zombie, and we haven't even calculated that into the first and third levels of this card. So this card is very quite good. Is that right? Very quite good? I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to say there. This card's very good. Uh, that said, I still don't think we're going to take it here. Graveborn Glutton is very, very powerful. Mostly because it's got those good underdrop stats. Um, basically what I mean by that is it's got underdrop stats, but it doesn't scale off into the late game. I don't know. Graveborn Glutton's quite fantastic. There's a lot I can say about this card. It's damage push. It's an abomination itself. It's generally a key part of the abominations deck uh, because it's a good priority level and it is a good underdrop. So I've actually got to think a little bit here. I'm pretty sure I'm between Graveborn Glutton and Nexus Tactician, and this is kind of a decisive point in the draft. If we take Graveborn Glutton, we're really going to value like the damage push, but if we take Nexus Tech, then Ionic War Charger is going to be like really, really insane. I think I'm going to take Nexus Tactician. It's generally just how I like to draft, and like I said, Sometimes drafting in Soul Forge is about drafting what you are more comfortable with. There's going to be players that are going to favor Graveborn Glutton here for its aggressive capability. There's going to be players that favor Gla Graveborn Glutton here for its ability to close out a game too with the damage push that its Vengeance Trigger deals. That said, I'm going to take the Nexus tech. I'll talk about these cards a little bit, I suppose, but a Loyan Strategist I thought was good enough to first pick. We see it here. It's definitely better than a whole bunch of non-heroic cards. That's not to say that all heroics are better than all non-heroics. You have seen that I have taken heroics every time when given the chance. That might change as we move on to the draft. I'll talk about these cards real quick, though, because what if somebody else was doing this draft and this wasn't an Alloyan Strategist here? What if this was a Charnel Titan? What if it was a Dr. Frankenbaum? Well, hopefully I can clue you in onto what I may have done in that scenario. I don't even know what this card does. Oh, if you have Formation, you get a trigger. Okay, so it deals some damage to them. It's about a... Graveborn Glutton, except with the fact that you need the formation, it means it's a little bit tougher to get it off. I don't think this card is that great. The stats are nothing crazy. The level 1 stats are fine, though, if you are looking just for more 6 attack creatures. Take a drink of water real quick, don't mind me. Right, 
Rotwander, we see a similar ability to the very first Necrium Heroic that we saw in pack one. However, this time the attack scales. Uh, the attack is able to hit most level two creatures by level three. And most level one creatures on the level two. That said, the stats are still pretty underwhelming. Let's pretend this was instead just played in front of a creature with three or less attack. That basically means this is a 3-6. I, I, I'm not sure if, if, if my analogy is like totally making sense there. Let's say your opponent has a 6-6 six, six, and you had a 6-12. You could play your 6-12 in front of their 6-6 six, six, and you would be left yourself with a 6-6. Six, six. That's basically what this is doing. Um, however, for most... So, so, so let's look at the numbers like that. 3-6, 6-12, 9-18. Those really just aren't numbers you want to be looking at as far as level 3 creatures go. If those were actually the card stats, it could trade with some things, but those aren't actually even the card stats. So it winds up being pretty underwhelming. Gloom Fiend I do like. It is an abomination. And... This card, I think you can just straight up add the ability to its stat lines and have a pretty reasonable expectation of what you're getting for your bang, for your buck. A 5-5, five, five, a 10-10, ten, ten, and then a 17-17. Seventeen, seventeen. And I think that's a pretty good stat line. It is one higher than Master of Elements. We've compared a lot of cards to that stat line so far. Um... You do have the problem, again, of, like, only leaving back a 12 attack creature. But 12's pretty high. It's a lot higher than 7. Uh, it's only a little bit higher than 11. But it's a lot higher than 7. And um, the the other thing is sometimes this attack it, or this, this um, swing of minus 1, minus 2, and minus 5 winds up being even better than it looks on paper because since you're impacting both attack and health, you can actually trade a negative battle into a positive battle. Let's come up with an example. Let's say the Dark Frost Reaper are... You know what? Let's, let's put a real creature to this name here. Let's say Dr. Frankenbaum is up against a Wirewood Patriarch, the 5-7 that we looked at earlier. Now, normally this would result in a negative battle for Dr. Frankenbaum. However, give that Wirewood Patriarch a minus one, minus one. All of a sudden, it is a 4-6, and Dr. Frankenbaum is able to positive battle that Wirewood Patriarch. So that winds up being very good, uh, and I do like it. It is an abomination, Zombie Infantry, solid card. Let's add up the total stat lines here. What do we got to do? 15 plus 15 is 30, uh, plus uh, 29. So this one, this one ranks in at 59 total stat line. Definitely a little bit underwhelming. 59 is still pretty good. Uh, basically, compared to a 5-5... 10, 10, 15, 15. You get one additional attack to make it a slightly better underdrop. And then you have a slight trade-off on the level 3. Unfortunately, we've seen this number 14 on a lot of level 3 cards, which generally makes this card pretty lackluster. Uh, that said, it is still a fine 6, 5 on player level 1. It's a zombie, which I think is right now worse than being an abomination. But Zombie is still a supported creature type, and that is worth considering. I am going to take Aloyan Strategist. That card's nutty. We never really took Aloyan Strategist and, like, added the uh, plus attack to the numbers. But basically, even if you're only giving one creature plus six, this is already... Yeah, this is 35... 
This is 11, so 35 plus 11, 46. 46 go up to 55, and then 55 plus 12. Yes, yeah, 67. So even just giving one adjacent creature plus two, that's not factoring the mobility. We're already looking at the highest stat line of any creatures that we've seen so far. So there's a comparison for that. Here's Deathseeker. Deathseeker has the opposite problem that some of the other cards do. The 1-1 one, one really has to matter. And the 1-1 one, one also really has to matter on every player level. If you are just playing this to block something random, that's fine. Then you're pretty much looking at a 6-5, 11-10, 16-15. Which are fine stats. I'll give it to you. The real trick is when you have to play this card on an open board and then your opponent just says sure and leaves you with a 1-1. One, one. That is really, really embarrassing. There are some additional bonuses to that that, um, you know, like if you're able to have a, we saw Spirit Leash earlier, destroy a friendly creature, give one of your other friendly creatures a bonus. If you have some ways to make use of that, sure, it's fine. The, the card is actually okay, and it isn't Vengeance either. It puts the creature right into the same space. Uh, I just don't think it's going to be as powerful as some of the other cards we're going to see. Abyssal Maw is a really, really tricky one. So this card's a 7-7, 11 19 but only if you have an Abomination. And I've thrown around the word abomination a lot, but it, it's really relevant. And the main reason that it's relevant is because of this card, Abyssal Maw. Abyssal Maw is the biggest payoff for abominations. I mean, 7 7, 11 11, 19 19 is really strong. What is that? That's. Uh, 20, right? Yeah, that's 20, 27, sorry, uh, my YouTube music was making some weird noises there. Um, yeah, that's uh, 54, wait, only 54? That seems low. What am I doing wrong here? 19, oh yeah, yeah, 19 plus 11 is 30. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 37 doubled, which is uh, 30 or er, er, 74. Um, so 74. Wow. Highest stat line by far that we've seen. Again, the fact that it can come into play and be a battle trick makes it even more potent. What you have to decide when picking Abyssal Maw is am I going to have enough abominations in my deck? Am I going to be willing to draft enough abominations? There's no hard and fast number on that. However, the fact that half of the cards, or almost half of the cards, it'll be half the cards after I take Abyssal Maul, will be abominations, eh, that's, that's pretty reasonable. And that means I think we are going to take Abyssal Maul in this draft here. I do want to look at the other cards. Aegis Conscripts is essentially a 3-7, 6-11, and 12-19. Those numbers are fine. Um, the armor you can even count twice sometimes. If Generally, you can count armor twice. Armor's uh, one of those weird things, and, and that's the reason that we took the Nexus Tech Titian as well, once you have a lot of armor, you can even start counting it three times. And if you have armor plus regeneration, then you can start doing some crazy maths. But basically, armor is really strong. Being able to add up armor and use some armor synergies is really strong. I think even though this card doesn't look super impressive... I think that this card actually is quite powerful, and I'm pretty happy to have some number of Aegis Conscripts in my deck. That's typically a card that I'm pretty happy to take. Tower Scout, I'm not ever super excited to take, 
but it is a solid card, a solid stat line across the board, as well as being damage push. One of the things that is also worth considering, like, say you don't have that much armor synergy, you're not sure how good Aegis Conscripts is going to be, Tower Scout isn't looking that impressive to you either, and you're late in the game, you don't have the uh, abominations to make Abyssal Maul work. What I would look at is I would look at how strong is my deck. Am I going to want the card that I take as a priority level, or which means a card that you actively try to play on every player level and level up to make your deck stronger, or am I going to want this card as an underdrop, which means do I want to not level this card and just have it sit in my deck? Um, now, underdrop actually means something more specific. It means cards that work well when not leveled. Um, but basically, is this card going to be a priority level for me? And if the answer is no, this card isn't going to be a priority level. I need more cards that are good when I don't level them. You might want to take Tower Scout over Aegis Conscripts, even though I think Aegis Conscript is a more powerful card. If you're just saying, well, I already have a bunch of 4-5s, I've got a bunch of 4-7s, I've got a bunch of cards with higher toughness than attack already, I just need some cards that when I don't draw my level 2s on player level 2, I want to be able to play two of them in front of a level 2 creature and be able to take it out. And that is something the Tower Scout can do. That said, I have three Abominations already, Half of my deck is Abominations after I take this Abyssal Maul. So we're going to be focusing a little bit on Abominations this draft. And we'll see how that works out. This pick is a perfect example of what I was just illustrating. Bizarrak Drake has Regenerate and gets Mobility if you have a 10-piece card in your hand. Now, I'm not going to be able to have any 10-piece cards in my hand because I'm not playing 10-piece, but it is still a potentially reasonable card. Tower Scout, also a potentially reasonable card. Every other card in my deck, though, is better, which means whichever one of these cards I take, I'm not really... <laughs> I am still streaming the same draft. I'm going to go super, super in-depth. Uh, yeah, this is just going to be a very long video explaining uh, kind of like every single possible thing for it. But, <laughs> yeah, still still streaming the same draft. And hopefully people can get some stuff out of this. Probably going to chop this into like 30-hour bits or 30-minute bits. 30 hour, geez, we're going to be here a while. Uh, 30 minute bits here. Yeah, that was 50 minutes ago. It is going to get quicker, though, as the draft goes on. At least I hope. Um, so, basically, the, the question here is, when we're not leveling these two cards, which one of these becomes better? And I'm going to favor the Tower Scout over the Bizarrak Drake here. Fellwalker is another card that Vengeance makes multiple cards. I think Fellwalker is a pretty reasonable pickup here. This is going to turn into personal preference, and that's all that this is going to be um, in terms of Fellwalker versus Tower Scout. And to be honest, I do tend to like um, uh, I don't know what you'd call these, like multi-card creatures when looking at underdrop. Sounds good, Palace. Um, yeah, you come back for the games. You can also feel free to skip ahead if you feel like you've gleaned enough information and just want to get onto the games. Because like I said, there's a lot of information to be gleaned there too. Um, but this is like first things first. So I think Fellwalker's a reasonable pickup here. I think Tower Scout's a reasonable pickup. And I could also see taking the Bizarrak Drake. The reason that I'm going to go for the Tower Scout is because it is slightly more synergistic with Nexus 
Tactician. Uh, just cards that actually have toughness that matters. Three toughness is not a amount of health that matters. Where's Tower Scout plus Nexus Tech? We get a 5-7. That's much more relevant than a 3-5. So let's take Tower Scout. There were no abominations in that pack either. So those weren't worth considering. Here we see Meta Transfer again, the ability to discard and level up a card. Then also Technosmith with the ability to discard and level up a card. Meta Transfer, I think, is slightly less powerful because giving a creature minus nine attack isn't as powerful on the level three version. I will admit it does have a lot of synergies with Charnel Titan. However, I'm still going to favor the creature over the spell in almost all scenarios here. Technosmith is a really solid card, reasonable stat line, and makes your deck a whole lot better. So I definitely like us a Technosmith there. Let's pretend this deck doesn't have an Aloyan Strategist in it for a moment. Holy moly, this draft is going to be good. What else is in this pack? Well, we have an Abomination. Graveborn Glutton is very fantastic. I don't even know what I would pick in this pack. Every card in this pack is great. If there wasn't an Aloyan Strategist, I would probably pick up Portal Shade. Uh, because you get a lot of strength out of this. After that, it's really close. Pummel Pack, Forge Plate Sentry, Ordnance Captain, all very powerful cards. I'll look at them in a second here and just talk about why, why they are powerful. Uh, Portal Shade, great stat line, gives you back creatures for free. Great card. Graveborn Glutton, we've already talked about once or twice. It really is a great card, and it's an abomination, but we're obviously going to pack it up, pass it up here for another Alloyan Strategist. Pummel Pack winds up being a plus two, plus two, plus three, plus three, and plus th six, plus six. If it's your only creature, it doubles. Only creature is a lot easier of a requirement to hit. And like I said, armor stacking can be great, and armor you can sometimes factor in twice. Um, if you're able to get the double armor, that's certainly going to be even more relevant. That probably turns this into a plus four, plus eight, a plus six, plus 12, and a plus 12, plus 24. Those are insane numbers. And Pummel Pack is definitely a powerful card. It is probably the card that I would pick here and it is certainly the card that I would pick if I had any armor synergies or if I was in Uterra and could make better use of the armor where Necrium can't really make as much use out of it. But think about if you were to put that Pummel Pack on a Forge Plate Century. Because it already has the armor, this card is almost untouchable. I'll talk for a second here too about going all in on a creature in draft. Um, you heard me use the term uh, Voltron. That's a term that is used sometimes in Magic the Gathering. Uh, another term that you'll hear a lot, a lot of times in Soulforge is the term Grow Tall. So growing wide would be making sure that you have creatures in all of the lanes. If you can grow wide and your opponent can't, then... You might be able to win the game just because your opponent can't block all of your cards and you wind up just dealing too much damage. It winds up being a very good aggressive strategy. Now Grow Tall is the option where you just make one huge creature that your opponent cannot deal with and win the game by just having a card that takes over. It's pretty impossible to do in player level 1 because the game won't finish before your opponent is able to draw level 2 creatures. I should say it's not as possible level 1 in draft. I also never recommend going all in on a creature that is rank 1. But a rank 2 creature is a little bit more... Um, there, there's going to be less cards that your opponent can play that say destroy target rank 2, level 2, or lower creature. And 
That makes level two cards a little bit safer. Obviously, they're just gonna be beefier in general. By the time you get to your rank three cards, those are gonna be even harder for your opponent to deal with. And they are also going to have the added benefit of you're going to have seen your opponent's deck by that point. So a lot of times when I'm playing decks like that, I like to go as all in as possible on rank two and use my rank one for setup. You can play some Techno Smiths. You can just play cards that are solid and level up still the cards that you know you're going to want. But again, that is the strength of spells too. This card might not have a good setup for it in rank two, but the difference between the rank one and the rank two isn't actually that big. And the rank one is already really good. Meaning if you can play this level one card while you're in rank two, it's going to still have most of its efficacy and still be a pretty good card. Forge Plate Sentry, great card. 4, 5, 9, 12, 15, 20, great card. Ordnance Captain, pretty solid card. You need formation, but it gives all of your dudes plus two attack. It itself doesn't have the best stat line, but it does pump itself. So 5, 6, pretty good. Uh, 9, 10, okay, solid. And then uh, 13, 14, obviously that scales off. You are almost hoping to use this card as an underdrop a decent amount of the time too, but uh, does still wind up being pretty good. Where, how would I rank this pack total? I may even put Graveborn Glutton last. I'm not sure. It's certainly Alloyan Strategist, then Portal Shade, then Pummel Pack. Uh, ranking the cards kind of in order by rarity. But after that, I'm not too sure. I'm not going to stress about it too much here. One resource that I would also recommend, though, while I'm at it, I brought it up one other time in this video so far, but that's soulforgeladder.com. If you are ever, like, unsure of a pick, a lot of times there are some pretty high-level Soulforge players hanging out on Kaliri's unofficial Soulforge ladder. What I would recommend is making an account there and just either throwing up a screenshot or saying, here's what I've drafted so far. Here's the cards that I'm looking at. What would you guys recommend taking? And we've got a pretty active community there as well as a pretty friendly one that is generally willing to answer all questions. I know it has been done before where somebody essentially is just like, all right, well, now that I've taken that card, what do I pick next? You do have to be a little bit careful of that because cards are going to be dependent on, you know, one person's pummel pack is... There There are going to be players that prefer pummel pack, ordnance captain, forge plate, or graveborn glutton, and have a different ranking for those four cards. I think most players are going to agree that Alloyan Strategist and then Portal Shade, maybe Pummel Pack gets thrown in there, but I think most players are going to agree that Alloyan Strategist and Portal Shade are the two best cards to take here, but I could see a lot of different orders for the remaining four cards. And that is one of the cool things about this game is different play styles and different players uh, appreciating different aspects of the deck or the game more. We're going to take a Loyan Strategist and not look back. That card's insane, and I'm super happy to pick it up here. Tower Vanguard needs some armor synergies, which means it's good with Nexus Tech. I still don't like it. Ruthless Wanderers, believe it or not, I have done a Ruthless Wanderers draft before. It is looking specifically for Spirit Wanderers, of which there are only three in the game. If you can get it going, the deck is actually quite powerful, but you need to be in Necrium Uterra for that deck to work. Don't consider drafting this card otherwise, just leave it be. That said, it does kind of help your Charnel Titan get to max value. I'm not going to worry about that, though. 
Jetpack we already talked about. I think we're going to be fine in terms of mobility, damage push. All of our alloying creatures so far, except for our tech cards, uh, can also provide damage push. So what card do we want to take here? Do we want to take Zithian Hulk or Forge Plate Sentry? I actually think this is very close. I think in general, Forge Plate Sentry is a much more powerful card. However, with our Abyssian or, or our Abomination uh, synergies, I'm actually going to go ahead and value Zithian Hulk here. And I'm going to take that as my card. I've mentioned Zithian Hulk a few times now throughout this ability as the baseline for stats on cards. I think a lot of people don't respect this card enough. I think this card is super respectable in terms of its stat lines. And if we line it up directly against Forge Plate Sentry without any battle tricks or anything like that, it is going to be a trade with Forge Plate Sentry. So I'm going to take Zithian Hulk. And I'm going to be pretty happy about that. This is, this is nutty. This is insane. This should not happen. I, I don't know. You know, like, I was, I was a little bit nervous when I was doing this draft video. I was like, I'm going to take all of this time. I'm going to discuss all of my picks. And then I'm just going to go 0-2 and lose all of my games. Well, you know, I'll be willing to eat my words if we lose with four Aloyan strategists I don't even know. I'm not even sure if this is an introduction to how to draft Soulforge. I'm not sure. How helpful? Let me know. How helpful, guys, is draft for Aloyan strategists dot vid? How helpful is this even? Because you're just not going to see this in the real world. Sure, when you do, you want to be able to capitalize it and you want to recognize that Aloyan strategist is one of the, if not the most powerful heroics. But geez, Louise, giving me four of them? Man, oh man. All right, Electronet is a fine card. It can sometimes turn a negative battle to a trade or so on and so forth. But um, it's generally not going to be that powerful, especially when comparing it to Meta Transfer. Basically, you don't really want it as a level 3 card in your deck, but it's fine as a spell being able to... Because spells you can keep level 1, and they still have a lot of their efficacy. Like I've been saying, Zombie Infantry we've talked about. Sorrow Harvester is an abomination with a slightly relevant ability and less stats than Zithian Hulk in general. I think Zithian Hulk is better. It has... One more toughness on each player level, which I think is better than when a friendly abomination is destroyed on your turn, draw a card. It is an abomination, but it is not an Aloyan strategist, so I'll take that. Here we do have an abomination, and we do have a card that rewards you for things like uh, Spirit Wanderer, or whatever the 1-1 one -one is that makes a 5-5, five -five and rewinds you, re rewinds you, uh, rewards you for making zombie tokens and things like that. That said... Still don't love the card. It's not going to be my pick here. Think this card is potentially playable, but you... I, I think it's almost more work than it is worth. Um, so just like as a thought experiment, let's say that we sack a 3-3 on every player level. We're looking at a 5, 6, 9, 10, 17, 18. That's good, but it's only one additional attack on the uh, Master of the Elements. Or sorry, one additional health on Master of the Elements on player, or on, yeah, on levels 1 and 3. So it's only two higher stats total. And... That's like a pretty optimal scenario, sacrificing a 3-3 three, three every time. Now, numbers don't really work that way. Having a grow tall strategy that I've talked about, especially if you can add on armor and other things, means that like one additional point of stats winds up being so much more. For instance, I'll say a... Uh, 
a 16-17 is a lot, a lot worse than a 17-17. I would even go far as to say a 16-17 is a lot, a lot worse than a 17-16, which I'm not sure is a stat line you typically see. Um, but basically, once you get to those higher numbers, every point kind of matters. So having something that's just a 21 uh, or a 2021 is really good. I think this card is still a little bit of a trap. We've talked about zombie infantry, but let's take a look at this stat line real quick. We totaled up the numbers. I think this was like 59, maybe it was 57. Blight Skull Phantasm has the same total numbers, I think, but also has an additional trigger whenever you gain a rank. Now, this trigger's not great. Um, you don't want to rely on this trigger too much, but let's compare this card's stat lines to Zithian Hulk. Plus one, minus one. Minus one health, same thing. So we are losing one point of total stat lines over Zithian Hulk, and we get a whole nother ability on top of that. This card I think is fantastic, and a lot of times I like playing this card even when we don't get the trigger, because it increases your chances of drawing a leveled up one and getting the trigger on the next player level. It doesn't increase your chance of drawing it. It doesn't have like consistent or anything like that. But it just increases your chances of having um, a bigger impact. Because the minus nine, minus nine late in the game, that is that is quite good. That's that's why we're playing Abyssal Maul for a minus nine, minus nine. But if we can get that on a level or uh, on a creature that has actual stats to boot, it's quite fantastic. So... I like all the Blight Skull Phantasms that I see, and I'm pretty happy to pick up that one. Here we have the choice between an Abomination, which I will say I do think is an underdrop still, Dr. Frankenbaum. Some players will disagree, and they will proactively level their Frankenbombs, which I think is fine. It's just not the strategy I like to go with. Then we have a Nixium Marauder. Now, a Nixium means uh, Aloyan Necrium. So, right off the bat, we know that this card is going to potentially suit our needs, and I'm not going to talk too much about it, but this card is pretty good. Um, you'll kind of have to see the gameplay to see exactly how all this stuff works out. What's up, Bacon Poet? Welcome to the stream, my friend. You'll have to see the gameplay to see exactly how these numbers shake out, but like I said... Armor stacking, armor with regenerate, that's all pretty good. It does get tough to pump an Anixium Marauder, but we do have a Nexus tech, and the level 3 is quite fantastic. It's a 1420, it is a, and it's like even more than that, it's like a 1426 most of the times. So you get some really good value with Anixium Marauder. So we are going to go ahead and take that there. Don't see any abominations in this pack, and we're starting to see a lot of cards that we know. Here's the Death Seeker. I am going to take Techno Smith here, passing up Palladium Hindermind. I think Palladium Hindermind is the next best card in the pack. We look at, looked at Crypt Whale already. Virix Embrace, I think, is pretty good as far as spells go. Um, it is a minus four, minus four, which can sometimes be a lot of, bit of, a lot of damage push. However, we're pretty good on damage push already with the Dr. Frankenbombs and Bacon Poet. Thank you very much for the cheer. Yeah, this is <laughs> quite the draft with all of the Aloyan strategists here. I thought this was, yeah, just going to be a normal draft. But yeah, we got, we got quite the doozy for us. Yeah, Bacon Poet can definitely realize the power of that. Necro Slime is pretty sweet, and it does stack well with both regeneration and armor, as well as creatures that, um, like Death Seeker. It can be a way to pop your Death Seekers. That said, I don't think it's really what we want to focus on, and Technosmith is just a solid, solid card that I'm going to be more than happy to pick up here. 
I just like to level my deck as much as possible and be pretty happy about that. Now, because we have so many Techno Smiths, we could potentially look at something like Techno, which is bad, then average, then great. And I think Techno is going to be the pick here because Techno Smith can allow us to skip this first level. We can't always count on it, but it is going to be really good when we can get there. Call the Week, I don't think is great in draft, but it is a reasonable underdrop spell for powerful activate creatures. That said, you do see a lot of effects like this, and I would much rather try to pick up like a Dark Frost Reaper or the 3366, what's it called? Zombie Rot Fiend or something. That said, if you're getting towards the end of the draft and you don't have any of these yet in your deck, it's not a horrible card. And Call the Week does actually level to be able to kill, like, say, a Loyan Strategist on every single player level. So it's not completely a card you want to write off. It's a fine card. And when you're playing a Loyan and you have things like Hinder Mine, whatever that card is, the 2 6, Call the Week gets better. And Villian Arbiter is really strong as far as its stat lines go. But I don't quite think I want to take it up here. Other than armor, its ability is pretty much going to be irrelevant. And if it is relevant, we don't really care about the things that it's relevant for in draft. That said, this card is like fantastic in constructed. And one of the reasons that you play draft is because you don't have the collection yet to be able to play a reasonable constructed deck. So if you were to take in Villain Arbiter here... I would not fault you. This is a great card for Constructed. And that's something I haven't really talked about too much here yet. Uh, that might be because this is the first time it's really come up. But if you want to take in Villian Arbiter and you are a new player drafting, I am not going to fault you at all. In fact, I might even just take it just to, just to assimilate that like real-world experience. Uh, I think Technome is going to be just a little bit sweeter in our deck with two Techno Smiths now already. So I'm going to take that, but whatever you take, I am happy with. Munitions Drone is a weird one. Gives another creature plus three, plus five, plus seven attack. So it's like an 8-8 eight, eight and a 14-14 on the final levels. Not really that fantastic. If you can activate it twice, it's good. But that's going to be pretty hard to do, considering it's not that bulky of a creature. Right of Undeath... Each friendly creature gets regen 4. I think that this is almost assuredly a bust. In order for regenerate to be relevant, it means that your creatures already have to be not dying, which means it's going to change like a... You, you pretty much already have to be positive battling for this to be relevant. And a card that helps you while you're positive battling isn't really a card that I care about. So I'm going to skip out on Right of the Undeath. Witherfrost Banshee is sweet. There's not that many ways to make use of the flank ability on it, which means it also triggers when this guy moves. But it's a 5-5, 10-10, 19-19. It's a reasonable stat line. Uh, a little bit less powerful than... Um, the Abomination. The fact that you also have to do it on the creature across from it means it's not really a battle trick. It's more a card that finishes something off or is just able to positive battle cards. I do think that this card is good, but I'm going to look at Aegis Conscripts a little bit more. I talked about this before. Now that we have the Anixia Marauder as well as Technome, hopefully some more good options for Aegis Conscripts come up. And the fact that it has low attack is hopefully negated by the fact that we have four Alloyan Strategists. So I'm going to take that here. Then we have Tech Explorer, which is a Technome that also levels itself, meaning it's also good as a Technome target. We have a Ruthless Wanderers, which I said, just don't read it. We've seen three of them at this point, which means that just just keep in mind, the only thing to look at for Ruthless Wanderers is the number that you see on a given draft. Because a lot of times you will see six of these during a draft, which means that once you see the other Wanderers, and I'll throw them up here, really you are looking for... Yeah, Rot Wanderer doesn't count, nor does Dark Heart Wanderer. Maybe, um... 
I'll talk to somebody. These cards might be worth renaming because that's a little bit silly. But these cards are the only Spirit Wanderers. And this one just has a raid trigger. It doesn't really care about anything else. This card says whenever a friendly Spirit Wanderer enters play, this card gets plus three, plus three. Where this card is decent is like if you rank up and then can potentially hit the level two. But also if you just have six Spirit Wanderers in your deck, you can be killing anything that your opponents play while making these pretty big. You can try this out in Constructed. It's not that great in Constructed, but every once in a while you get a draft deck that is essentially akin to the uh, Constructed deck. You wind up getting two or three Restless Wanderers, which is really the number that you need to make it work, and then you can easily get six Ruthless Wanderers and really just go crazy on your opponent there. So here I'm going to take Tech Explorer. Howl of Zith is just damage to them. And then you gain X, where X is three times your rank. So let's imagine you're an aggressive deck. Do you want this card? No. Um, an aggressive deck doesn't want to make it to player level four, which means at most this is going to get them for nine, you gain nine. Which means it's worse than that whale card that we saw earlier. Whale as in uh, W-A-I-L not W-H-A-L-E, but it's much worse than that whale card that we saw earlier, and it is just not, uh, I don't know what words I'm looking for here. It's not, it's not good, it's not as good as that even, oh, that's what I was going to say. It's not as good as that even, and we didn't even take that one, so it can't be that great. Give me one second here while I change the music off of Katy Perry. I mean, Firework, sweet. I'll keep it on Firework. We might change it after this song, though. Um, where Howl of Zith shines is in long decks where you're just looking for... I would actually say Howl of Zith can shine in a deck like this. I don't think that this deck in particular is going to need Alloyan Strategists. But say these Alloyan Strategists were like the, uh, the Hindermind card. We're just shrinking all their cards... We don't really have that many ways to win. We're just stalling out the game. We're going to get to player level 6. And we're going to get a bunch of Frankenbaum triggers. Then I would consider Howl of Zith at rank 6. Getting to hit your opponent for what? Uh, that's 24 damage, right? Um, or no, 6 times... 6 times 3. 18 damage. Um... That is uh, 24 damage, gain 24 health. Sometimes that can be better, but um, I generally shy away from drafting this card ever. There are players that will take it to good success, but you don't want to draft it if there's anything else playable in the pack. And Tech Explorer is definitely playable. It's a pretty solid creature. Bad, average, great and we might even be able to cheat the level one. At the very least, even if you can't cheat the level one, you get to level up another card alongside it. So as long as it doesn't make you fall too far behind, you can do some good stuff with it. Moment of truth, all in on abominations or just take the Blight Skull Phantasm. I could actually see just ditching all of our abominations here. Instead, we still have 10 more cards to pick up. I think we're going to take some or be able to grab some more abominations. I really do like Blight Skull. But uh, the more abominations we take, the more we try to commit to this, the easier that's going to be for us. So I'm going to go ahead and take another abomination here. This pack has got some interesting cards in it and some pretty powerful ones and some new ones that I'm going to have to talk about. We've talked about these Necrium Commons already. And of the three of them, I might even lead towards Zithian Hulk still. Maw it is. Um, might even lead towards Zithian Hulk still just because I like the idea of just having a few more abominations in our deck. It seems like that could be pretty solid for us. Nexus Pilot is a card that is worth talking about just on its own here. We have one other card that is a center lane card. And different draft formats are going to have different amounts of cards that get additional effects while they are in your center lane. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think I know what we're going to be picking already, and I do think that it is going to be that group meal. But I want to talk about all the cards here before we get to that. Nexus Pilot is really fantastic. You do actually just want to count it. Like, don't look at it as a 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10. That's not what this card is. You are rarely ever going to play it outside of the center lane. So this card is a 6, 8, 10, 14, 16, 20. That is fantastic. The only drawback is that it has to be in your center lane. That drawback does come up when you're trying to block your opponent's creatures. That drawback is also going to come up if you draft too many Nexus pilots, but um, they're just they're just all things that you want to, I guess, keep in mind. Uh, but this this is really a fantastic card. I'm just not going to take it here because I think Group Meal being able to give a plus two attack and a minus two attack to all enemy and friendly creatures, respectively, I think is really, really powerful, and uh, this is one of the instances where I am going to take a spell over a creature because the spell is powerful enough. Bitterfrost Totem, I've also come back around on. I think this card is pretty solid. It is an underdrop, to be sure, but most spells are underdrops, and you don't want to level them um, aggressively accordingly, but it's a minus 6, minus 10, minus 14, it's pretty solid. It's very good at pushing through damage and dealing with problem cards from your opponent. It is generally always going to trade or change a... Uh, trying not to use the word trade when talking about changing positive battles and things, but it almost always changes a negative battle into a positive battle, which uh, is definitely worth playing a full card. I would probably take Nexus Pilot over Group Meal here, but and and Blight Skull and Zithian Hulk are also really good. But I'm going to take Group Meal, and I'm going to be pretty happy about that as well. Uh, I think they're, uh, I think they're all solid cards there. And another pack with some pretty good cards here. I think I am looking at taking Aegis Wings. So we've actually talked about all of these cards so far, other than Aegis Wings. And this is a card that gives plus three attack and then an additional armor and mobility. If that's the highest attack creature, we can pretty easily make something the highest attack creature with a Loyan Strategist. Yeah, this, this deck is going to be quite nasty. But also just like on the chance that we get to put the Aegis Wings on a Nixium Marauder or compile it with Aegis Conscripts... We're going to have a lot of armor that we can potentially be able to stack now. I don't think the Abomination's worth it. do think Nexus Pilot could potentially be worth it here. And it's certainly the pick here after Aegis Wings. But I don't want to take a Technome. One thing that's funny about Nexus Pilot is I normally pass the first two that I see. And the reason that I do that is because a lot of times you'll see them in the early picks. And I never want a deck with five Nexus Pilots. The only real drawback of Nexus Pilot, other than I guess not being able to wield some Aegis Wings, is that multiples have diminishing returns because you're not going to be able to use multiples. So generally I want maximum three center lane cards in my deck and I'm only ever going to level two of them on a given game. Let's take Aegis Wings here and then we have the option for Abyssal Brute, Scavenger Scorpion as an Underdrop Abomination, or Tech Explorer. I'm going to take another Tech Explorer. I think it will work well alongside itself and the Technomes and Techno Smiths that we have. And I'm going to just be happy taking that here. Bissell Brute, I think, is also really great. One of the reasons that the Onyxium strategy is cool is because you've got cards that you want to put in the side lanes cards you want to put in the center lanes, and then you want to get these formation triggers. I'm just going to take Tech Explorer, I think, here, though. Bissell Brute is also cool with mobility. You can move into a side lane and get that trigger. Um, I'm not sure. I think I still just want to go with Tech Explorer here. This is really close, though. I'm going to go with Tech Explorer, though. It's very, very close. 
All right, I'm going to grab another Nexus tech, and that is going to be my other center lane creature. I'm not going to worry as much about the fact that I don't have that many uh, Nexus Overwatches or whatever that other card was called. I believe it's called Nexus Overwatch. Um, Nexus Pilot. Nexus Pilot, my fault. Uh, Nexus Overwatch is another center lane card that is not currently in the draft pool, but Nexus Pilot is um, uh, a little bit tricky in that it is always actually able to threaten a Nexus uh, tactician, which is kind of funny, but we're just going to make our... Um, our Alloyan strategists harder to kill with these tacticians here, rather than making them harder to kill with the other guy. So do I want a Nexus pilot? I said I'm willing to draft three, and I think I am going to stick to that rather than take a Charnel Titan here. We don't really have that many ways to make Charnel Titan active, even though it is an abomination. I guess we do have group meal now. Yeah, I'm still going to go for Nexus Pilot. And then I'm going to say I'm done on center lane cards. No more. Don't need any. And we can get another Anixium card here. To, oh, no, never mind. I was getting this confused with something else. This is not an Anixium card. It does work well if you can give it some armor with your tech... Or Nexus Tex. Uh, this also works well with the armor from Nexus Tech. Meta Transfer is a reasonable one, but we have so many cards now that level up cards. At the same time, it's good with Charnel Titan. I'm not sure. Aegis Pulse, I definitely don't want. This card is basically the ability of Nexus Tech, but in a spell rather than a creature. It is permanent, uh, but it only affects the cards that are currently in play. Then we have Grave Pact, which is an underdrop removal spell, and I think might actually be the pick here. I don't really want to destroy a friendly, friendly creature to answer something, but just having it as an answer in the deck is going to mean that there's a lot less things that we can lose to. We also do now have two cards that are worth sacrificing in our Technomes on rank 1, as well as our Technosmiths that generally lead to a negative battle. So I'm happy with a Grave Pact here. Well, another Tech Explorer, another Grave Pact to go along with it, two cards that we've seen and discussed, and one card that we have not seen or discussed yet. And I think this is going to be the pick here in Orion Field Marshal. Each other friendly creature gets plus one attack. Um, and yeah, we, we could go all in on the explorers here, even more so. We'd be able to have four explorers at this point. Yeah, yeah, the um, the auto mod picks it up. I don't, I don't necessarily love that word, but I think the fact that your your chat got censored is uh, enough of a warning for you there. So won't won't harp on it too much. But Orion Field Marshal, though, I think is going to be the pick. Uh, we might just want some more cards with relevant stat lines. And we are going to pass another Abomination here, but it's not a fantastic one. No problem, Bacon. Let's grab that, though. Guardians Assemble. Total joke. Don't even read it. It's bad. I guess if you want it for constructed purposes, it's fine. But it's really not good. Bitterfrost Totem. Pretty good. Forge Guardian Alpha. It's got Defender. So it really acts as a removal spell. Um... Yeah, it's not exciting. It's just a removal spell, but with limited applications. The You know, one thing I didn't really talk about as far as this ooze goes... Oh, yeah, no, I know it's bad and constructed, but 
since this is aimed at newer players, maybe they'd want to try something out. Maybe they just need more... Um, like, maybe it's just worth more if you scrap it um, than some of these other cards. One thing I haven't really discussed is the synergy between these multi-card cards and a Loyan Strategist. The thing is, you don't really need that much to get a Loyan Strategist going, but it does work pretty well with these Vengeance creatures. I'm going to go ahead and take it, I think, over Bitter Frost Totem. Now, I probably shouldn't take it over Bitter Frost Totem. That's the problem, is there's just nothing I want to take it over. Maybe we'll see one more ooze here. No, it doesn't look like it. We just see a Palladium Hindermind, which I keep saying is a good card, and then not taking it. But Forge Guardian Beta is definitely going to be the pick here. This card, I think, is actually getting a little bit of a boost come next Tuesday. I think it's going to have an additional armor on rank 1. I'm not totally sure about that. I actually don't think that this card needs it. I think that this card is A-OK -okay as is and don't really think that it should be changed. We have four tech cards that can level it up as well. So we don't really even care how much armor it has on rank 1. We're just going to completely bypass that. Nano Swarm and Jetpack as our last cards here. So, here's, here's like an interesting decision that you have to make. Yeah, uh, if you check the subreddit, there are cards that are going to be receiving an update on Tuesday. So, I'd recommend checking that out if you have not already. <laughs> yep, you will be able to see the first match here. Not sure how many matches I will get in today. Uh, I do want to be able to provide full commentary on everything, so uh, the, I might record the other ones on a different day here. But let's look at these two cards. Nano Swarm. Remove all abilities from a level 1 creature and give it minus 5 attack, minus 10 attack, minus 15. And then this one hits level 2s. But it's gated, which means you have to level it for it to be relevant. Now... Sometimes your opponent will go all in on rank 1. This is a great example of why it's a bad idea to go all in on ranked 1. And Grave Pact even threatens the idea of going all in on rank 2 even. But you just really don't want a spell that you've got a level. I don't care about giving a level 1 creature minus 5 attack. So I'm just never going to care about this. Even though my deck already has tons of mobility, I'm actually going to take a jet pack here. And... Maybe this will provide us the, like, last few points of damage that we need. Maybe we give a creature a jetpack, and then we give it an Aegis Wings, and then we just move over, and we, uh, we finish off our opponent there and uh, are able to kill them. So I'm going to take Jetpack, and that is going to complete our deck here. So I am going to... Once that's done loading, I'm going to jump into view deck. I think that if you have not looked at your deck in a little bit, this is always a great screen to come and check out. So just a quick plug for the view deck feature. Think one last time over like, okay, did I actually get the amount of abominations that I would have liked to get? I only have, what, seven abominations? Uh, maybe six. Yeah, I've got six abominations. Still, a fifth of my deck is Abominations. I can kind of, on average, expect to get one per hand. So it's not unreasonable. And this is the deck that we are going to go forward with. And I will see you guys in the next videos where we actually get to some gameplay. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed.